Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson and you're listening to the Kurt Angle show. And of course we couldn't do it without your hall of famer. He won the Olympics with a broken freaking neck and he's here with us today. Mr. Kurt Angle. Kurt, how are you, sir? I'm here in the house. I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you, Conrad? Man, better than I deserve. I'm enjoying seeing all the great feedback we're getting online. If you haven't already follow us on Twitter, it's uh, at the angle pod on Twitter and uh, you can have a voice in what we're doing next. We're running some polls and whatnot. And next week, our topic will be Kurt's rookie year. And that actually won the poll that you guys voted in over at the angle pod. But today our topic is no way out 2006. Gosh, time flies. Uh, no way out 2006. This is the last stop on the road to WrestleMania 22 and your matches against the undertaker. Uh, that's our main focus today. No way out 2006. It's held at the first Mariner arena in Baltimore, Maryland, February 19th, 2006. That's the eighth annual no way out pay-per-view. It's a SmackDown only show. Uh, it is a sellout. We've got 11,000 fans in attendance, 218,000 buy it on pay-per-view. Baltimore is like an old wrestling town. Would you agree with that? Kurt? Oh, without a doubt, uh, we would sell out every time we went there and they were so enthusiastic. It's a great city, a great town to uh, have a show in. Definitely. The uh, 218,000 buys on pay-per-view feels like a foreign concept now because of the WWE network. Yeah. Um, was this something back in the day when you made have been a pay-per-view where you was that a big deal because you knew it meant you're going to get a big pay-per-view bonus or was that not really the case by 2006? No, it was the case. You, you still got, uh, more money. I mean, the more pay-per-view sales you do, you know, the more in ticket sales you do, the, the higher amount you get paid. So I think every wrestler got paid more when there was a sellout crowd and, uh, a high pay-per-view rate. Did any of the promoters or talent relations guys or whoever over the years ever explain what the methodology was, like how, how the formula was crafted to figure out what the main event got? I don't think anybody has that. I think yeah. Vince has a formula and he uses it and he doesn't tell anybody. Well, the main event here, of course, is the world heavyweight champion, Kurt Angle, taking on The Undertaker, and the title is on the line. The event is also remembered for the feud between Randy Orton and Rey Mysterio. This is the same angle where, regrettably, Randy Orton said Eddie Guerrero was in hell. Uh, ironically, the same night on SmackDown, you would tag with Mysterio against Randy Orton and Mark Henry. That's a pretty controversial topic at the time that we've revisited recently with Jim Ross. What do you make of the whole Eddie's in hell storyline? Is that too far, or is that fair game, do you think? Honestly, I think that... Eddie would have not been upset about it. He knows, he understands the business and how to, you know, wow people and, you know, say some things that people say, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Um, and Randy is one of the best at that. So, you know, if anybody's going to do it, Randy Orton 
uh, is the best heel in the business. He's always been. He's incredible as a heel, and he remains to be that way today. Unfortunately, we've got some bad news in the observer in this era about your health. Meltzer would write the latest angle neck injury appears to have stemmed from his January 16th match with Shawn Michaels when he landed badly doing the angle slam off the top rope. That move may have to be removed from his repertoire. Most feel he's not pretending to be hurt publicly into the office because he hasn't had a title run since 2003, which he believes is because Vince McMahon doesn't trust his durability to put him in that position. He hasn't actually missed time in a long time and has been pushing hard for 18 months that he should get the title either on SmackDown or raw. So let's start at the beginning of that report. Do you remember this match with Sean and the angle slam where you supposedly were re-injured? Yes, it was our rubber match and, uh, it was on, uh, raw, I think. Right. Um, and, uh, I did an angle slam from the top rope and landed on the back of my head. I broke four vertebrae in my neck. Again, um, I, uh, you know, I, the thing is I went back to the doctor and the good thing was no discs moved. They stayed in place. The vertebrae were broken. They were cracked. So my doctor, I asked him if I could still wrestle because I, I knew I was going to eventually get the world title because I stayed healthy for so long. And this setback would have set me back even further. And I probably wouldn't have won another world title in WWE. Uh, for the duration that I stayed there. So um, it was important to me to stay in the, you know, in the game and, and uh, get another world title. And so I asked him if I could keep wrestling. He said, as long as you're careful, um, you'll be fine. So I did wrestle. I won the world title with my neck broken uh, against Mark Henry. Then I, I actually wrestled Undertaker no way out with my neck broken. So um, it was, it wasn't a smart move, but it was something that I felt that I needed at the time. I'm curious, does that motivation come from the businessman in you who says, Hey, if you're the world champion, you're going to make more money. Or is it the competitor in you of, Hey, uh, I've always won gold medals and world titles and I kind of want to win another one. It's both, you know, I, the, you get paid more obviously. And, uh, you get more titles added to your name. So uh, you get the best of, be- both, of the best of both worlds uh, with that situation, definitely. What do you make of Meltzer's report that you haven't really acknowledged the injury as much as maybe you could because you wanted to sort of change Vince's mind about your durability? Did you think Vince questioned your durability at this point? I believe so because I didn't have a title run for, I think, uh, uh, two or three years. So, you know, there was, I had a lot of health issues with my knee and my neck. And so, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't holding up the way Vince expected me to. So uh, the last thing I wanted was another injury and I got it, but thank God I was able to, uh, I don't want to say hide it, but, you know, keep it under wraps. The angle slam. Is that one of the reasons we started to see less and less of that because of that injury? Yes. I actually broke my neck prior to that at WrestleMania uh, against Eddie Guerrero, I, I angle slammed him from the top rope and broke my neck there as well. So it happened on two different occasions. I just didn't take it out of my repertoire and I probably should have. Right. Meltzer would continue. He's claiming that even if he needs surgery, which he's going to hold off as long as possible, he'll only get the same minor surgery he's had twice and would be back in two to three months as opposed to a fusion and missing one year. He said surgery is safer than fusion. So if you're wondering if he learned anything about his reoccurring neck injuries, well, there's your answer. He said this is the first time in his career he's allowed to be himself as opposed to some dorky goofball, some nerd. What do you make of that? I mean, you've admitted before that you really liked making an ass of yourself and hamming it up, but were you excited that now you really are the wrestling machine and you get to be the real Kurt Angle? Well, from a performance standpoint, you know, you're not as entertaining. And that's what I missed about being the goofy character sure. was being funny and entertaining and being a dork. And I like doing that. But I also like being the wrestling machine, being an intense son of a bitch that goes out there and, you know, crushes people. And, you know, I had a battle back and forth of, you know, what I like better. But, 
you know, the, the, from a, from a performance standpoint, from a acting standpoint and character standpoint, I like the Olympic hero. The wrestling machine was more of a wrestler. Talk to me a little bit about the fusion surgery. We've, we've touched on it briefly before in hindsight. Do you wish the first time you had a, a neck situation in the company, you would have had the fusion and, and well, how the problem you- was, and this is what Meltzer doesn't know. I was going to have to have three of my uh, vertebrae fused together. Mm. If you get three of them fused together, you're done. You retired. Absolutely. You can't wrestle anymore. So I, I decided to have the repair done uh, the first couple of times and uh, it worked for me temporarily, but I mean, fusion would have been the better option, but I would have had to retire. Let's uh, let's talk about some other news and notes at the time. Uh, it's coming out here that the UPN is going to be changing uh, to the CW network. SmackDown had been a, a big part of UPN and now they're going to be here on the CW network. Uh, TV is also sort of moving and shaking with the new Saturday night's main event shows going to NBC. This will really be the first time that you've been featured on broadcast television like this for the company. Do you remember that being a big deal or was it something that sort of wasn't on the boys radar as much that we're on NBC? Well, I, it was a big deal because CW, you know, actually became a, a major network. You know, right. it was network TV. It wasn't cable. So being on network TV, I think for WWE, besides their Saturday night main events, I think it was the first time they actually got network. Right. You know, they're on USA, uh, um, USA network, but that's cable TV. Right. But uh, yeah, the CW was network TV and it was a big deal. The, uh, the idea of the return of a Saturday night's main event. So many of our listeners grew up with that myself included. You necessarily didn't grow up a wrestling fan, but <laughs> was that a big deal to be on a Saturday night's main event? I mean, obviously people were telling you about the history of the show and whatnot, right? Oh yes. It, it has an incredible history and it was a real honor to be part of it. Um, you know, they, I think I only did it once, I believe. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you did a bunch of them, but I know there is a a main event that's going to have John Cena and triple H defeating Kurt Angle, Ray Mysterio and Randy Orton. So it's mostly a raw feature, but still, Hey, it's Saturday night. That was a, that was a preclude to WrestleMania, right? That's right. That's right. Yes. I remember that. That was, I believe WrestleMania 22. Uh, if I'm correct. So that's that's when we did the Saturday night main event was before that. I do remember that. Uh, There's also a discussion here of bringing back ECW, but this is going to be sort of the relaunch of the ECW brand. And I know we're going to talk about that in the future because you're going to be a part of that. But did you have any concept of what ECW was? I mean, I, I know that you you saw the whole crucifixion angle and all of that nonsense and that sort of put a bad taste in your mouth. But did you know that there were still rabid fans of a dead promotion at that point? I knew there was, um, you know, the, the ECW was a very popular brand and what they were able to do with what they had was nothing short of incredible. And, you know, Vince McMahon uh, buying it and ended up putting it on air. I, I do understand that. I, I, I get it because it's just another popular brand that he's that he owns and that he's part of. Um, a quick story: uh, when ECW tried to start ECW, he came to me and he said, "Hey, I want you to be the face of this new company that I'm starting." And I said, "Well, what is it?" He said, "ECW." I said, "That's ECW." He said, "Yes." We're gonna we're gonna ramp it up, and I want you to be the face. And uh, but I'm gonna tell you this: you're gonna work in smaller arenas and lay, make less money. I said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't worry, I'll take care of you. So what he did is, I would do the the house shows and the TVs, and then the pay per views. Vince would triple my pay mm. so that I would get the same money as I would if I was on Raw or SmackDown. So. He would triple my pay-per-view uh, by pay uh, to make up for the TV and house shows, the money I made there. So he did promise that, and he did uh, go through with it. <laughs> wow. Another day. Uh, let's yeah. talk about your old friend, Stacy Keebler. She's all over the media this past week because she's on Dancing with the Stars. 
Uh, she even gets uh, the TV guide cover, a bunch of other magazines like Entertainment Weekly. She has appearances lined up on Ellen and Larry King. Were you ever approached about doing Dancing with the Stars? I think once upon a time, maybe 2009, that was discussed. Do you remember that? Well, I was just, I discussed being interested in it. Okay. And uh, I, I wanted to be part of it. And, but I think the issue was I had a little, you know, problems with, the painkillers and the alcohol and, you know, got a couple of DUIs at the time. And I just didn't have a solid name out there. And, you know, I kind of ruined my reputation for a while. Okay. So there was no chance of me getting on at that point. I had to spend the next several years making up for my reputation and making it strong again. And now I'm back stronger than ever. But back then my, my name was, you know, dragged through the mud. It was pretty bad. Let's talk about New York City for a moment. Uh, the company has essentially taken a pause from running Madison Square Garden, and they're running Nassau Coliseum, and they do a strong showing there. And Meltzer would report it means it's unlikely we're going to see very many MSG shows in the near future. Of course, that's essentially the home away from home because Vince's dad ran that building with some regularity. But the company pulls out because they feel like it's too expensive to run with the attendance they're pulling. Sometimes Jim Ross has even said they would sell the building out, but lose money because the operating income was so, or the operating costs were so taxing there. Yeah. Was it still special as a, as a performer to be in Nassau Coliseum, or is there really something about the mystique of Madison square garden? Well, both arenas are awesome, but, but Madison square garden is where it all started. And it's right. the most popular arena in the world. Um, you know, they, uh, you, you having shows there that the problem was that the company wasn't making money. They were losing money. So they decided to go out to Nassau and that that's where they booked their shows. I don't blame them for that because, you know, when you, when you, when you book Madison square garden, you're booking the whole arena and you're booking um, the labor union, the, the workers. So you have to pay them and they take their time and they spend a whole day. Uh, they, they spread it out and, uh, make it as long as they can so they can get as much money as they can. And it, it got to the point where they, the company was losing money because of it. So Vince decided to back out for a while and just go with NASA with uh, Long Island. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the other station. The UFC here is going to have one of their biggest shows in history in February of 06. It's the Iceman Chuck Liddell taking on the natural Randy Couture. Uh, this was box office for them. Uh, yeah. the, the whole ultimate fighter TV show really helped level them up. And then they had a, a series of matches here with Liddell Ortiz and Randy Couture. And these did some of the biggest numbers in, in fight history. Of course, these are legitimate amateur athletes and you once upon a time were doing that at the highest possible level. Of course, is this on your radar at all? Are you watching these UFCs and keeping up with what's happening? And are you getting an itch at all about what could be possible if you threw your hat in the ring there? Yes, I, I was interested. I'd say around 2001, UFC be started becoming really popular. This is after Dana White purchased the company. Right. And um, <clears throat> by then, I was well into my pro wrestling career. So I was kind of putting feelers out, watching the product, uh, you know, watching Randy and, and Chuck and Tito. Uh, they all had uh, great programs together. I mean, the, the, the fights were awesome. Um, but, um, I, I just, you know, by 2003, uh, when I was thinking about possibly doing it, I broke my neck again and right. my, I lost a lot of strength in my upper body. My arms got so weak. Um, you know, a good example is, uh, when I, uh, did that deal with Daniel Pewter and, uh, he got me in an arm bar and, uh, I couldn't stop it. I mean, it was, he had me pretty good. You know, if I wouldn't have pinned him, uh, he would have uh, broke my arm. Uh, so I knew that I wasn't ready for that. Or I just was, I was, I was, I guess, not healthy enough to do it. And uh, I never looked back. There was no way I was going to actually do it. I actually approached U UFC again in 2006. Dana White offered me a contract. Uh, but uh, I asked him if I could do TNA and UFC, and he said, you can't do it. You have to do one or the other, not both. And I just signed with TNA, and I 
felt an obligation to continue on with them. And I'm glad I did because there's no way in hell I was going to do UFC. I was lying to myself. My body just wasn't healthy enough to do it. It wasn't healthy enough ever since the Olympics when I broke my neck the first time. So I, it was, I made the right move. I made the better move by going into pro wrestling. But when you see a guy like Randy Couture become heavyweight champion, you got to think in your, in your heart, I could have beat that guy, right? Well, you know what? Randy is the good. The great thing about Randy is he's a great prepper preparer. He prepares himself uh, for each fight. He studies his opponents. He nails it down, knows exactly what they're going to do when they're going to do it. He studies film and he, he watches it over and over and he trains his butt off. Randy's the hardest worker I've ever known. And uh, so I, I wasn't surprised that he was UFC champion. Um, you know, he had a great wrestling career too. He was a, a world silver medalist in Greco Roman. Uh, you know, he's had so, a lot of accolades in amateur wrestling. He was the Olympic alternate. I'm surprised he didn't make the Olympic team, uh, but the, he did have a stud in front of him. And, uh, you know, so you're not going to beat that person every time. They're going to beat you a few times. You're going to beat them. So it was a back and forth thing. And the other guy actually, uh, uh, won that year during the Olympics. So he went to the Olympics instead of Randy. Let's talk about uh, some other things that are happening on the WWE side of things. The company's business is doing okay here domestically, but a tour of Japan, well, it fell short of the mark. There's a February 4th show at the Yokohama arena that drew 8,530 fans, which was considered pretty respectable. But then you guys have a show in Tokyo and it's the smallest crowd to ever see a WWE show there. It's announced at being 7,090 fans, but Meltzer says there's really only 4,000 paid. And the, it's headlined by you versus Mark Henry with, believe it or not, Ricky the Dragon Steam Bree. Why do you think this tour wasn't as successful, and what do you remember about it? I'm not sure why. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was just that I thought the SmackDown brand was uh, – uh, Japan's favorite, but obviously it wasn't uh, because when Raw went over there, they did a lot better. Uh, I'm not sure why, but maybe uh, we didn't have enough stars. You know, you had Mark Henry, myself. I'm not sure who else was there, but uh, it could have been a lighter card, and that could have been the reason. But Japan has a history. Uh, they're, they're always selling out when WWE goes over there. So uh, they've had an incredible history with Japan. And um, you know, they, they, we've always done extremely well in sales over there. How did you like wrestling in front of a Japanese audience and how different was it from wrestling in front of an American audience? They're less vocal. They study the match more. They applaud appropriately. Um, they're not wild and crazy. They, you know, it's just, it's just steady the whole match, but they do respond. That's just their type of behavior. And I kind of like it. It's pretty cool. I, you know, I didn't have a problem with that. The, the fans were really enthusiastic. They just more self-behaved. <laughs> uh, Mick Foley made an appearance on Bite This, which was the WWE.com's old web show. And he talked about who he would like to wrestle. And he brings up Edge, Hogan, and Kurt Angle. And he noted if he was going to have to wrestle you, he would have to know in plenty of time so he could get in a good shape. <laughs> Did you ever hear about the possibility of a match between you two and WWE. I think the only time it happened was several years later in TNA, right? Yes. I, I didn't know that Mick Foley was uh, pushing for a match with me. I wish I would have known. I would have pushed for it as well. Uh, but, you know, I did wrestle him in TNA and unfortunately he did not get prepared for it. <laughs> I blew him up in about two minutes and uh, Mick was struggling the whole match to make it through. Uh, you know, my intensity is unmatched, so I, I don't blame Mick. I, I kind of slowed down for him, uh, but he was out of the game for a while. I mean, he, he wasn't in the ring for a long time, so this was kind of his first match back in a couple years, and uh, so I, I, I understood why he blew up so quickly. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your feud with The Undertaker, and I guess we'll give the backstory as well. Uh, I think your first pay-per-view match together was fully loaded 2000 mm. and he beat you with a pretty wild looking last ride power bomb, which was a fairly newer move for him at the time. Four months later, your WWE champion and your first pay-per-view title defense is also against the dead man. 
Uh, this time you're able to uh, score the pin with a little bit of help from your brother. You had a feud in 2002 on SmackDown involving a triple threat match uh, with The Rock. So it's The Rock, Undertaker, and yourself at Vengeance for the Undisputed title. But after that, you're really separated for the better part of three or four years. Uh, as a reminder, the year began with you as a bad guy on the Raw brand, and you're feuding with John Cena. You worked an Elimination Chamber match on January 8th at New Year's Revolution, a match where Cena would win, but it's a night where Cena lost the title to Edge afterwards in the original Money in the Bank cash-in. Uh, and during this time, you're managed by Davari, which is kind of a odd pairing on paper. What do you remember about teaming with Davari here as a duo? You know, teaming up with Davari gave me a lot more heat. Uh, that, that was the whole plan. You know, Vince McMahon, uh, you, my character at the time was so seesaw like uh, baby face heel, baby face heel. Cleaner, yeah. And, and, and most of the times I was right in between. Half the people loved me, half the people hated me. So having Davari with me made more people hate me than like me because he was uh, considered a, a very good heel in the business. And he brought in a lot of heat just because of his behavior. Let's, uh, let's talk about how uh, it feels like in this era – they, they went from thinking maybe you weren't that durable to, Hey, let's put it behind glass and break it in case of emergency. Because when Batista goes down, he's the champion on the SmackDown brand and you make an unexpected appearance and win a 20 man battle Royal to determine the new world heavyweight champion. It's a major shift because you've been a bad guy on the other brand. And now here you are on SmackDown in a weird way. A lot of times in, in professional sports and even in wrestling, opportunity arises when injuries happen, right? Yes. Well, the, the, the problem was I just got traded over the raw, right. And, uh, being on raw for a couple months, uh, you know, Vince McMahon pulled me aside and said, Hey, Batista went down. I need you on SmackDown. And I said, Vince, I just got here. He said, well, there are a couple people that I asked that don't want to go. <laughs> I was like, Oh, I guess, I guess you're asking me to go. I, I guess you're telling me to go. So I, I said, I'll do it, Vince. I don't care. I mean, you know, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'm a team player. So, uh, you know, let, let's do it. So I, I ended up doing it and uh, ended up winning the world title, which was which was great. But, you know, I, I was excited to be on Raw. I haven't been on Raw for a couple of years, and it was kind of new and exciting to me. And I had to go back to SmackDown. But it wasn't a problem. I just had to adjust. At the 06 Royal Rumble, you defeat Mark Henry. And this is a period where they're really pushing Mark Henry as a main, a main event guy, probably for the first time ever. How was working with Mark here in early 06? Well, Mark was great. Uh, he the, the problem with Mark was he kept getting injured. He had bad timing. Um, you know, things weren't going right for him. Uh, he wasn't getting it. He wasn't uh, getting the psychology as well as he should have. And by 2005, a light switch went off in his head, and overnight he just got it. It was like he, this guy's a seasoned worker. He's really good, and uh, it just happened. I, I think, you know, maybe you know, Mark might be better under pressure, and you know, his ten-year deal was coming up, and he knew he had to refocus and show Vince McMahon that he could make, you know, make it as a as a great worker in the business. And he did, he did it. And, uh, that, that got him another 10 years, uh, contract. So, you know, Mark, Mark did the right thing and, uh, he improved and, you know, by 2006, he was a Z seasoned veteran. The end of that match is what everybody remembers. Once you beat Mark Henry, uh, the lights go down and, uh, all of a sudden the undertaker shows up and it's quite a spectacle. Lightning hits the ring. It causes it to collapse. Taz even yells, holy shit. It left a major impression. What do you remember about that moment? It was euphoric. Anytime I'm in a ring and Undertaker's entrance hits, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm not being disgusting here, but it, I want to orgasm. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's orgasmic. You know, being out there, you just mark out. You're like, holy shit, it's Undertaker. And he's coming toward me nice and slowly, and he looks scary as hell. It is the coolest entrance I've ever seen of anybody, period. 
The February 3rd SmackDown rolls around and Michael Cole asks the same question as the undertaker comes out. Uh, Cole says it may be one of the greatest matchups in history. And, uh, I, I, I gotta wonder, man, this is, uh, this has got to be, feel like a special time, you know, after such a spectacle like that at the rumble, normally as you head to the February pay-per-view, it almost feels like a throwaway show because it's not the rumble and it's not WrestleMania. But when you start with lightning and explosions and fires and collapsing rings, and now here he is coming to the ring again, this has got to feel like this went from being a not so important show to a really big damn deal. It was a big deal. It was a big deal to us both Undertaker and myself. Um, you know, I, I think that the fans love the show as well, but, you know, uh, having Taker uh, come in at No Way Out and you wrestle him in the main event, uh, you know, usually it's a down a downer pay-per-view, but it was an upper pay-per-view. It, it was a good, it was booked really well. And, you know, Taker actually uh, wanted to face me at WrestleMania. He told me this back in December before I had the match at Royal Rumble. And he, you know, he asked me, hey, I'd love to face you at WrestleMania. And I said, that'd be fantastic. He said, okay, we're going to have to go to Vince and ask him. So we went to Vince and asked, and Vince said, no, we're not ending Taker's undefeated streak. He didn't tell me why uh, I would end his undefeated streak. But the reason was I was going to win the world title. Right. And then, uh, you know, and then go to WrestleMania and uh, then I would have to wrestle somebody for the world title, holding the world title. I think that Vince McMahon felt I was going to hold the world title at WrestleMania, which I didn't, and we'll get to that later. But sure. um, you know, Taker, it was it was it was really awesome to, to have him at uh, No Way Out. But the the reason that Vince booked it was we wanted the match at WrestleMania, so Vince said no, but we'll make it at No Way Out. So he booked the match angle versus taker at no way out to replace WrestleMania idea that we had. Of course, the February 3rd SmackDown, that's where we see both of you in the ring together. Uh, Undertaker's out first. He's letting everybody know that he's got his sight set on the world heavyweight championship. You make your way out with your classic theme. That's going to change in a few weeks, but you cut a promo where you say undertaker, let me make one thing very clear. You've proven time and time again here in the WWE to be unstoppable but I've proven time and time again to be the best in the world. You make people scream. I make people tap. You may be the phenom, but I'm a wrestling machine. And looking at us, we obviously don't have much in common except for one very crucial thing. When that bell rings, I don't have a soul either. I'm just as unrelenting and, as un and unforgiving as you are. And at no way out, I don't plan on resting in peace. I plan on breaking your ankle into pieces. Uh, and there you go. He responds. You're going to rest in peace. The bell hits. He vanishes, but still a nice little promo that sets the tone for a big match. And the following week, he's wrestling Mark Henry on SmackDown. Uh, Henry eventually gets the upper hand and before undertaker, uh, uh, gets the upper hand on you rather. And undertaker kicks him out of the ring. Teddy long makes it a handicap match for the following week. So it's going to be Eminem and Mark Henry against the tag team of undertaker and Kurt Angle. This was something Teddy Long loved to do. He would make tag matches as the GM of SmackDown. There's memes all over the internet about it. Uh, but that's sort of classic old school booking. Let's take two guys who are going to face each other at a big pay-per-view, and now let's see if they can operate together as a cohesive unit, as a tag team. How did you like working with him as a tag partner in this particular instance? It was great. Undertaker was awesome. He, you know, anytime you can tag team with Undertaker, you know you're in a good spot. And he's so seasoned and and just, you know, uh, has so much experience. It, the match is more methodical when you have Undertaker in there. So it's it slows down a little bit more. And it tells a better story. And even in tag matches, he's able to produce the athletes in the ring to do better and tell a better story. And if they're going too fast, we'll say, slow down, slow down, you know, but sell for me, you know, just, you know, you know, take your time. Don't, don't rush things. So, uh, you know, the thing is, and you, when you tag with undertaker, you know, you're going to get a lot of time. Right. So, you know, the office is going to give you as much time as you need. That's always a good thing. You always want more time than less time. 
I really like that you point that out because the match with you guys and Eminem and Mark Henry goes 15 minutes and 40 seconds. And they tell a great story throughout the match. Like Taker starts out the match, but you make a blind tag on him, which creates a little bit of tension. There's a moment when you're both beating up Joey Mercury and Nitro and you sort of look at each other and you're trying to outdo one another with who can kick this guy's ass the most, which is kind of fun. But there is an interesting thing that happens before the match starts. You get new music and new pyro. I've always been fascinated about the little tweaks to the presentation, who makes those calls and how they're made, but you get a different music here and the pyro was different as well. When you first got pyro, there'd be like four blasts that went off in a row and the last one being the biggest. Now they're rapid fire blasts with uh, a much bigger one at the end. Is this because you're about to become the main event of, of WrestleMania again or in, in a world title match and are they trying to ramp that up or is there another strategy for changing the music and the entrance after all this time? I think they wanted to change the entrance music and the entrance because I, I was pre- positioning into the wrestling machine yes. and it's a more intense wrestler. That's why the pyro was louder and more intense. Um, you know, the music, uh, I believe they were trying to hide the, you suck chance. I see. And, um, they weren't able to work it out, so you got what you got with this, with the re re recording of it. So you have the repeating over it again. So uh, you know, I'm not sure why they did that. <laughs> uh, it it didn't help anything. It didn't hurt anything, but uh, they didn't co- accomplish much with the music. But with the with the pyro, they did accomplish a lot. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, backstage segment you had on that particular SmackDown. As a reminder, Rey Mysterio has, has won the Royal Rumble, and now they're trying to screw him out of that opportunity to be in the main event at WrestleMania for the world title. But you bump into Ray, and, and the network would even label it as you're giving Ray a pep talk. But you say something like, it would be my honor to face Ray Mysterio at WrestleMania. This is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, Tweener is maybe the definition. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? I mean, everybody loves the undertaker, but here you are sort of supporting a baby face, right? Well, I think that's how, how they wanted me to go into WrestleMania was being a baby face. Uh, I'm not sure why, because, you know, I wrestled undertaker and no way out. He's a baby face. Right. I wrestled Ray and Randy and Ray is a baby face as well. I think, I think the reason that they didn't, they wanted me a baby fa- or yeah, a baby face is because if Randy and I were both heel, we would have annihilated, right? Um, you know, it, it would have been, you know, a, a very unfair fight. And I think that's part of the reason why they didn't want me to turn heel because if we dump up on, I don't think Ray would have had a shot. And I don't think any fan would have thought he had a shot. And if he did win, the fans would say that is bullshit. So right. I think that part of it was they wanted me to stay babyface so that we didn't uh, gang up on Ray. Let's talk real fast about uh, the match here at No Way Out 2006 and how it's different. Because when the Observer poll comes out, the fans voted this nearly unanimously the best match on the show. Kurt Angle versus Undertaker. It's 150 votes. Orton and Mysterio get 17. No other match gets a single vote. But that's fascinating to me because you go back and you look at your first matches on pay-per-view, particularly the fully loaded 2000 show, and Meltzer hated it. He gave it a very poor rating. Was it something where you guys just got familiar, more familiar working with each other, or was he still trying to figure out the American badass character? And maybe you were just new in your career. What was it about your chemistry together that greatly improved in just a handful of years? Well, I wasn't a seasoned veteran in 2000. I was still learning. Uh, Undertaker was calling the whole match to me in the ring. Uh, You know, by 2006, I was pumping on all pistons. I was was a stud. I was the best wrestler on the roster, probably the best wrestler in the world. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that. Uh, Undertaker and I would have a five-star match. There was no doubt about it, and uh, we actually did. It was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, the the thing is, Undertaker, he he is so good at what he does, and you have to match his intensity, and you have to be every bit as good as him. He he can carry you, but you have to perform with you. 
did that. I did that really well. And I think that Undertaker and I were in, I would say, our primes, our primes of our career in 2006. Even Undertaker at that point, I believe he was in his prime. So we were prime season veterans that were going at it. We had years of experience behind us. Let's walk through the match. Meltzer would write, the match started slow. The first big spot was Angle whipping Undertaker's knee into the ring post and doing a figure four around the post. Haven't seen that move in years. That's an old Bret Hart move. Did you catch that from watching tape? Was there an agent who suggested it? How does that come to be? Do you recall? Well, Undertaker brought it up because he said Bret Hart used to do it with him. And uh, so I thought it was a pretty cool move. And, you know, yeah. we, I think we even might have done the, we did the, the the hit on the post, but did we do the figure four on it too? I yeah. can't remember. You are, yeah. Yeah, I have done that a couple of times. I got it out of Bret, Bret Hart's playbook. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, 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 you you want to be the best, you got to steal moves from the best. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, it was a great spot in the match, and it worked out really well. Did you watch any uh, old Bret Hart footage, like when you were first learning about professional wrestling and, and, and in camps and things like that? Are you studying old tapes, and, and who would have directed you to study what matches and all that stuff? I didn't study old tapes because I was told not to because the okay. psychology changed. Uh, you know, when, when the attitude era would came around, there was a lot more action. It wasn't, uh, you know, you didn't start off slow. I think everybody was starting with punches. Nobody was tying up. It was, it was just the intensity level of the attitude era. Uh, you know, you didn't tell a story at the beginning of the match. You didn't wrestle much. You want right. You know, uh, the, the thing is, you know, you get attacked backstage and you go out there and you're mad and, you attack them back and, you know, during your match, you, you know, the GM will book the match. You go out and have the match. And instead of starting with a tie up in wrestling, you're mad because he attacked you backstage. So you start beating him up. That's how almost every match was. I mean, it just was ridiculous. So um, I did want to watch tapes of old school wrestling matches. I wanted to watch tapes of the previous or the present product and what they were doing. So I watched a lot of Stone Cold, Rock, Triple H. Um, once I got to know him, Shawn Michaels, uh, you know, Undertaker, I, I watched a lot of their stuff. Who would have been the uh, agent on this match? Do you recall yourself an Undertaker? I can't recall. Uh, I believe Pat Patterson. He usually was my agent, so I'd have to say he was. And uh, he probably came up with a couple of the ideas of the match as well. How much of a match, a main event like this with The Undertaker, not a house show, not a TV main event, but a pay-per-view main event in, in 06, how much would The Undertaker have called in the ring and how much would you have laid out ahead of time? We probably laid out 70% of the match uh, because you had to. You know, sure. you had submission trade-offs, false finishes. Uh, there, there are a lot of spots in there that uh, you can't call. You have to uh, plan them ahead of time. But Undertaker pretty much carried the rest of the match. He would, you know, he his his psychology was so simple, but it was so effective. He would start by working your arm, and then when when the heat would come, he would um, he would tell you to move, and he would uh, hurt his own leg, run in the corner, and, and and then you know you get the heat that way. So he did that almost every match, and it worked extremely well. So he would call all that stuff in the ring. And then we would call the, we would have the stuff planned, the, the false finishes and the submission trade-offs and the, the finishes planned ahead of time. Taz is on commentary for this show. Uh, he's now calling matches with AEW and we just saw a, as this airs a few weeks ago, it was announced that big show had joined AEW and he's going to be doing some commentary over there. How was Taz as a commentator? Did you enjoy his work and uh, that he did for your? I, I love Taz. It's, I love this style. He he was a more of a freestyler. He he ad libbed quite a bit. Um, that's what he's best at. He was doing that in ECW. You know, he would say whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Um, so Taz, you know, you, you got to keep it, him under control a little bit because he can get out of hand. He can say a lot of f bombs and everything like that. So, you, you know, you have to keep him under wraps, but he's a very uh, enthusiastic person and it comes out really well. Talk to me a little bit about 
Big Show making the switch. I know that this has been the talk of the internet as you and I are recording. It was the biggest news this week. Were you surprised to see that Paul White is no longer wearing a WWE jersey? Yes, I, I, I always thought that Paul would be with the WWE the rest of his life. I mean, he they treat him really well. Um, they did a lot for Big Show. Uh, you know, when he quit and went to be a boxer, um, you know, he lost a bunch of money and Vince, you know, helped him out a little bit and got him back in the game. And, you know, there, there were a lot of things that occurred that, uh, you know, Vince McMahon showed his loyalty to uh, Big Show. And I, Big Show showed it back, no doubt about it. But, you know, when, when he did that show, the Big Show, uh, I thought that was a WWE um, show so i'm not sure if that's if, if it's a if it's a netflix show or if wwe actually helped produce it so i thought he was in with the company forever because i thought that the big show show was going to be a wwe product but i guess i was wrong i guess it's not so um you know i think big show probably felt a little bit underappreciated in wwe the last couple years they've they've had them you know they humbled him quite a bit, had him job out here and there and, you know, put it, you know, tuck his tail between his legs and walk yeah. away and just, so I understand why, you know, he was frustrated, but, you know, I thought he would be with the company forever with the WWE, but you know what, if he's happy, I'm happy. We're getting questions all the time about, well, they said Sting could never wrestle again and he's wrestling and it was in the release that, Big Show, while he may be doing commentary, he might wrestle occasionally. Do you think we'll ever see Kurt Angle in an AEW ring? <laughs> I don't think so. And, you know, I text Big Show and I said, hey, congratulations on signing with AEW. And he said, oh, man, I feel like I'm 25. And I was like, holy shit, you're going to wrestle? <laughs> He didn't, he didn't answer me, but <laughs> <laughs> he said he felt like he was 25 again. I guess that means he's going to wrestle. I don't know. Let's talk about the match here. The Undertaker hits you with a leg drop on the apron, but then when he tries to follow up, you snatch him and put him in an ankle lock on the floor. Over the years, you've uh, had a lot of uh, ankle locks out of nowhere, to borrow a phrase. Do you have a favorite ankle lock moment? I, You know, my match with Chris Benoit at the Royal Rumble 2003, the submission trade-offs, you know, getting it when he had me in a crippled cross, cross face and, you know, put my hand down, grabbing that ankle and popping it out of nowhere back into the ankle lock. Um, that match was super special. And the transitions I did there out of nowhere were pretty cool. I also uh, enjoyed uh, doing it with Undertaker, you know, doing the sunset flip over top of his head and him doing the, the, the landing on his back and grabbing his ankle and flipping over and getting the ankle lock in. Uh, those were my two favorite ways of getting into the ankle lock. You know, catching with Sean out of nowhere was really cool. I did it. I did it quite a bit, but it, it, it's a it's an exciting move because you can do it at any time. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the next series of of moves here from the Undertaker. He's going to catch you in a triangle choke, and Mel this is 06 now. Meltzer would say, "Boy, did the crowd need an education process because the first time he put it on, nobody reacted to it. It's okay. By the end, they figured it out." It's all about the education process. I think both guys really like the idea of working with each other because the undertaker is such a big fan of real fighting and angle is a fan of making his matches look real. So they're on the same page with their ideas. This was when the undertaker who was a real life fan of the UFC and mixed martial arts started to implement more MMA style stuff. He wore the MMA gloves. He would also use go-go platas and triangles and lots of jujitsu moves. Was that something that you guys knew you were going to try to do together. And were you excited about working that style in a pro wrestling match? Well, we knew we would have to be very um, patient with it. We knew that we would have to do it several times, uh, you know, to educate the fans throughout the match to tell that psychology. So, you know, Undertaker got me in it two or three times. And by then the fans got it at the end. And the thing is, you know, being on your back and having that, that, that hold on you, um, you know, you're, you're risking getting pinned, but, you know, Undertaker stayed busy. He would, you know, he had the ref would count one, two, and take would pop his shoulder up and keep the shoulder up and have the, the, the hold in as well. 
And then his shoulder would go down. The ref would count one, Pedro would put the other shoulder up. So he stayed busy. He made it make sense in the fact that he could get pinned. Uh, so I understand why, you know, Meltzer might think that, you know, it's not a good idea to do it and that fans aren't educated. But you can educate them in one match. It's really simple. You just have to do it over and over again until they get it. And that's what we did. There's another spot in the match here where the undertaker threw you into a uh, poor ring announcer, Tony Chimmel. <laughs> oh, After yeah. Chimmel takes the bump, you give the undertaker an angle slam through the English announce table. Undertaker at one point is about to be counted out, but you break up the count. We've talked a little bit about those announce table spots and how if it breaks, that's actually in your favor. That's what you're hoping for. It's way worse if it doesn't. But unfortunately, Tony Chimmel's streak with WWE broke this past November. I can't believe this is real. After all those years, they parted ways. They cut him loose. Were you surprised to see Tony Chimmel get released this past November? Yes, I didn't expect that. Tony's been a loyal employee for, gosh, what, 30 years? Forever. Um, I, I, I didn't know that uh, WWE would have done that. I, I just think that it's a shame because Tony – has gave given his heart and soul to the WWE and the business. And, you know, I wish him the best. He's a great guy. A really scary moment happens next here. You and undertaker are fighting on the outside. Undertaker whips you into the ring steps and part of the broken table catches you in the throat on the way down. Meltzer would write. It was seven kinds of scary. You come back pretty quickly. Tell me about that moment and what's going through your head when that happened. I was that close to, uh, crushing my trachea. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was scary. I, I, you know, there was no way of stopping it. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get my chin down and it just happened so quickly. And uh, I'm just lucky that I didn't get seriously injured. Thank God. When Undertaker's on the top rope, he ran up and do a belly to belly off the top for a near fall. Undertaker comes back and goes for a choke slam, but you roll it into an ankle lock, another very creative transition. And Undertaker nearly makes the ropes, but you pull him to the center. They're pushing the idea that the undertaker has never tapped in his life. The undertaker, of course, gets out again. You, uh, you uh, unfortunately suffer a choke slam, but you kick out. Taker goes for the last ride. And then you did what's known as a Toyota roll into a sunset flip back into the ankle lock, like you just described. And the undertaker once again, gets out after a long struggle. You're telling the story with the submissions here and you use another angle slam. He kicks out. He sits up this time. And he put him in another ankle lock. That moment in a match where you're waiting for the Undertaker to do that iconic sit up, is that something you plan ahead of time or does it just happen and then you react? No, we, we planned that ahead of time. That's you know, that's that's one of Undertaker's spiels. And you know, we Signature wanted to add part, that yeah. we wanted to add that in the match. So uh it, it was a great idea, and you know, me slapping the ankle lock on was a great idea afterward. Uh, the more ankle locks I gave Undertaker, the more the fans believed he was going to tap out. Sure. I had the fans believing in the last three minutes that Undertaker is probably going to tap out. It was really believable. Eventually, uh, he breaks that ankle lock and then he kicks out of another angle slam, but then he locks in a triangle choke and you tease tapping and they do a spot where the referee lifts your arm and it goes limp twice, but not a third time. That's sort of old school. Uh, whose idea with that? Do you remember? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Undertaker wanted to do it. He said, you know, this is an old school thing and, uh, you know, let's do the three hands and you keep the hand up on the third one and, you know, then we'll go into the finish. So I did what he told me to do. You tease tapping, but then you flip over while you're still caught in the triangle. It's a jackknife cradle. That's the pin. You win the match. 29 minutes, 37 seconds. You retain. Meltzer gave it four stars. And once again, wouldn't you know it, Kurt Angle steals the show. What did you think of the match when it was over? Were you pleased with it? Oh, I knew right then that we, we nailed it. We, I knew, you know, whether Meltzer, you know, I don't know what four and five stars mean. I usually use the term five star when the match is better than expected. But, yeah. you know, I know Meltzer has these ratings. Sure. And sometimes he's he's on, sometimes he's not so on. But uh, I understand why he does it. But, you know, the match to me was the five star match. It was go as good as it possibly could have gotten. The only setback was the finish. 
But the finish made sense because I like that's it. the only way you're going to beat the Undertaker. You're not going to make him tap out. You're not going to pin him. And and yeah. I thought it was really well done. You don't see that very often. And I'm curious, like, is that? I mean, I assume since you think Pat Patterson was the agent on this one, Pat Patterson, Michael Hayes, guys like that have a reputation for being quote unquote finish guys. So you know the the writers are going to help us get into this feud and they're going to help us create this big match, but. How we finish the match is very, very important. And there's a handful of guys who have a reputation for being tremendous finish guys. And I assume Pat Patterson's right at the top of the list, right? Actually, you're going to be surprised over this. Jamie Noble came up with that. Awesome. The day of the show, uh, Undertaker and I were discussing the match. And, you know, we, we had a couple house shows where we perfected some spots and came in. We were We still had an open finish and we couldn't figure it out. And Jamie came up with, you know, he, he saw Undertaker put me in the hold. Um, triangle choke? Triangle choke, yeah. And uh, he said, oh, hey, I have a I have a move where you can uh, pin him from here. I said, well, I know I can pin him. He's, I got him. He's on his back. He said, no, I want you to flip over and trap him so he can't get out. As long as he got the hold in, he can't get out. So, you know, Jamie came up with the idea. We put it into our rep- repertoire. I've heard a lot of people who work on the inside of WWE talk about Jamie Noble like he's a wrestling genius and that perhaps whatever role Michael Hayes feels right now, Jamie Noble is the heir apparent to that. But I've also heard other people say he maybe has too Southern of an accent for Vince, which is silly, (laughs) but that is prime on brand for Vince. What can you tell us about Jamie Noble and Way be what his well, he's got a hell of a southern accent, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> he sounds as southern as you get. I mean, yes. he's yeah, he uh, you know, he's from West Virginia, though, so I understand why. But, um, I don't know. I mean, I you know, Vince, you know, he has these pet peeves. I wouldn't be surprised if his southern accent gets on his nerves, so it might be true, but I don't think so. I don't think that's the reason. But as far as being a wrestling genius, you're spot on with that. You think you? Oh, Jamie Noble is as smart as they get. He's, you know, with experience because he's been wrestling probably, you know, in the in the business twenty years. Yeah. But you know, with a few more years experience, he's going to be up there with Michael Hayes and Pat Patterson. I mean, he's he's got all the tools, and he 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 is really well educated in the business. He he's one of the best agents producers that we have right now. Meltzer would write uh, of the finish here. Has anyone asked a question why someone who is on his back applying a triangle, the ref doesn't count a pinfall on them? This was used as the entire rationale of why the guard can't be used in pro wrestling 50 years ago when jiu-jitsu versus pro wrestling worked matches were held because holding guard, the guy on the bottom was being pinned. Well, that's food for thought for another day. I know you're not necessarily an MMA expert, but what do you think of that? We have a little bit of creative freedom because we're pro wrestling and we're entertainment. Yeah. I mean, pro wrestling is anything you want it to be. Yeah. You know, if you want the fans not to believe that Undertaker's going to get pinned because he has a triangle choke in, they're, they're going to believe that. You just have to make them believe that. You got to show them that, educate them that during the match. So you can't just put it on once. You got to put it on two or three times to get fans to say, oh, okay, this is the move again, and he's not going to get pinned, so this match will continue. So it's just a matter of educating the fans. we got a lot of questions about this match, and if you'd like to ask a question about next week's topic, which is going to be Kurt's rookie year, go ask it right now at the Angle Pod on Twitter. Uh, Michael McClanahan says, uh, Conrad recently discussed this with JR. However, what are Kurt's thoughts on incorporating Eddie Guerrero into the Rey Mysterio, uh, Randy Orton feud? You sort of said you thought that was probably fair game. That was okay, right? Oh, that, that was fair game. Uh, the, the whole reason Ray won the world title and the whole reason for the program was to commemorate Eddie. Right. That, that, that was the whole issue was to show Ed, you know, to show how much Eddie was adored and cared about. And, you know, he, the, you know, Randy might have gone a little too far with some of the things he said, but that's part of being a heel. I mean, you know, you want fans to say, that guy's disgusting. You know, he makes me sick. 
So Randy did the right thing. I don't, I didn't have a problem with the program and I understood why Ray was in that spot. He was representing Eddie and Ed Ray is very vulnerable. Eddie's not vulnerable. So, you know, doing that to Ray and talking about Eddie the way Randy did, uh, it makes people feel more sorry for Ray for being in that position. Uh, so it, it was a great program and a great story. I thought it was. Uh, Jordan has an interesting question. He called this match one of his favorites of all time, but he wants to know, do you think this match should have been at WrestleMania? Now, we know we, t- we heard the story of you talking to Undertaker beforehand, but when the match is over and you're going back through the curtain, do you think Vince maybe wondered, damn it, I should have saved that for WrestleMania? I, I think that if you don't think that Vince was thinking that, you're high. Yeah. Because... Of course, he's going to say, damn, that was my main event at WrestleMania. Yeah. Of course, he's going to say that because I legitimately thought that that match was the match of the year in 2006 of the whole entire year. I mean, I know there are a lot of great matches, but I really, I took pride in that match. I thought that was one of the best matches that anyone's ever done. And, you know, the to not be at WrestleMania, you know, that... That's, you know, Vince probably was like, oh, shit, man, I should have just done it. And and what he could have done is he could have had Undertaker beat me for the world title. He just didn't want Undertaker to have the world title at the time. So I think there was a way to make it work. If Vince was cool with giving up the title to Undertaker and then giving it back to me or to someone else, you know, that, that would have been a good idea. But I think that, you know, he just felt like it was too much work. Right. All for one thing to happen, for one match to happen. But I believe when he saw the No Way Out match, he probably said, damn, I should have done it. Thomas Henley says, if Batista didn't injure his back, would this match have happened at WrestleMania instead of No Way Out? Probably, right? I don't know. I I, I believe so because, uh, you know, Batista would have been in my spot and, uh, you know, he would have ended up wrestling Randy and Ray. So um, maybe Undertaker. I know that he didn't have a match book. I didn't have a match book by January. So there could have been a possibility of Angle versus Undertaker. For whatever reason, it didn't happen. But the problem was Vince didn't want me to lose a title at WrestleMania. I did anyway. I lost it to Ray. So uh, either way, uh, we should have had the match at WrestleMania, Undertaker and myself, because I lost the title anyway. Undertaker could have beat me, and I could have not ended his undefeated streak. The good buddy, our last question, wants to know, how bad does a potato hurt from the Undertaker? From Undertaker? Yeah. He doesn't throw potatoes. The guy is as seasoned as you get. He He's as light as you can be. Um, if anything, I potato him quite a bit. <laughs> I have a reputation of uh, throwing stiffies and uh, Undertaker. You know, the funny thing is one time, first time I worked with him, it was that pay-per-view in 2000. Uh, he, he grabbed my chin with his hand. He was getting his arm ready to hit me. And I started going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he started laughing. He goes, what the hell are you doing? He said, I'm not going to touch you. <laughs> he said, you're a pussy. <laughs> He punches me and it didn't touch me. I, I just didn't know. I thought, okay, this guy's big. He's strong. He's got long arms. He's gearing up to punch me. I'm going to turn my head. <laughs> so every time I see him, the first thing he does, he goes. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Hilarious. By the way, you can see the video of this and get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. Next week, we'll be back for Kurt's rookie here. But before we get out of here, We've got to talk about physicallyfit.com. I think you've seen now, Kurt. We've loaded it up on social media. Literally, my entire office is eating chicken snacks now. I know. It's awesome. <laughs> you guys actually ordered them. You paid for them. This is awesome. Yeah, and you don't just have the uh, the chicken. You've also got plant protein, too. There's plant something protein, for everybody. Yeah. Go to physicallyfit.com and click on where to buy at the top. And when you see where to buy at the very bottom, you'll see order online now. Uh, so if you don't have a store near you, just go to order online now. But dude, my my parents are even into this. I can't believe it. But mom and dad are rocking <laughs> they're addictive, the man. World. Dude, they're good. Uh, they Super are. Dave and Dave Silva and my whole crew 
We got a whole box of these and literally within an hour, they were all gone. The word had spread through the office. We've got to place another order. Uh, they're only nine 99, but they're great. And they're not bad for you. They're, they're filled with protein. Tell them about it, Kurt. They're high protein, low carbohydrate. They're very healthy. They're made from chicken breast. Uh, they're derived into a Chex mix type of texture with flavorings, you know, Sriracha, honey, barbecue, uh, pizza flavored cinnamon swirl, a lot of great flavors. You're going to love them. Go to physicallyfit.com to order or amazon.com or the one you said, Conrad. Yeah. Physicallyfit.com is where I went. I clicked on where to buy. Okay. Uh, and then you can just scroll down to the bottom right there and order online. I, they actually have stores in my area who have them and there's probably stores near you, but it's just easier right now during the pandemic, man, just bring it to my door. Uh, and don't right, forget, right. you can also go to KurtAnglebrand.com. And if you click on the shop button, not only can you get an autographed cowboy hat, you can get an autographed Kurt Angle milk carton. You can even get birthday cards, eight by tens. And I didn't know this was the case. You're on Cameo. So if you want a special yes. message from Kurt, you can do that too. It's all at KurtAnglebrand.com. Kurt, how are you doing all this? You're staying super busy, man. I don't know, man. I, I have two movie reads today, too. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. I'm starting to get the, the Hollywood's opening up and, uh, you know, I'm starting to get more chances and opportunities. So uh, it's it's been a really busy time. But I have to say I got a nice rest. I've been off work since last uh, March. So, you know, it's been almost a year since I've been working. So uh, it's actually a good thing. Well, we're happy that you're here. We're having a blast. We hope you are too. Uh, leave us a five-star review if you think we've earned it. Click the subscribe button and tell your friends about your new favorite wrestling pod. It's the Kurt Angle Show. It's each and every Sunday morning right here on Westwood One. We'll be back next week discussing Kurt's rookie year. You don't want to miss it. It's the Kurt Angle Show right here on Westwood One. We'll see you see next, you next week. time. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.